having authority and not as the scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit and he cried out, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him saying, be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit convulsing him and crying with a loud voice came out of him. And they were all amazed. And they kept on asking one another, what is this? A new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him? At once, his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. The grass withers and the flower fades but the word of our Lord stands forever. Amen. Well, in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus is a man on a mission. In just the first chapter, Jesus is baptized. He's driven out into the wilderness where he's tempted by Satan. He begins his ministries, calls the first disciples. He heals a man with an unclean spirit, Peter's mother-in-law, and a leper, all in one chapter. And I think Mark is trying to convey to us the urgency of Jesus' ministry and message for his listeners. Jesus is a man on a mission, and he's not going to lollygag around waiting for a good time or to have the right equipment. He's jumping in feet first, and we are jumping in with him today. Jesus is in Capernaum, Peter's hometown, and it's the Sabbath. He went to the synagogue and began to teach, and Mark adds, as one having authority. And in the middle of his teaching time, a man who had an unclean spirit cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Basically, the unclean spirit recognized Jesus for who he was, the Messiah the anointed one. And Jesus rebukes the spirit and orders it to come out of the man. And the unclean spirit did come out of the man, but he did not go silently. The man convulsed and cried out, and then the spirit came out of him. And everyone in the synagogue who saw it, well, they were all amazed. Now, I have to be honest, as a preacher, this has never happened to me that someone has come to worship while I was preaching and caused a ruckus because they had an unclean spirit. But I've always suspected that there is nothing like an exorcism to get the attention of the congregation. <laughs> now, we may not have a story exactly like this one from the Gospel of Mark happening to us. We have had and will have, though, many opportunities to offer healing in Jesus' name. And there are two facets of this story today that I believe intersect with our lives these 2,000 years later. The first part of this story that I believe has a great deal of bearing on our lives is the question the unclean spirit asks of Jesus. Do you remember what that question was? Anybody? What have you to do with me? What do you have to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? It's a great question, isn't it? And one I believe we can ask as individuals and as a community of faith, what bearing does Jesus have on our lives? Well, Reverend Todd Weir recalls an experience that gets to the heart of this question. He writes, this week I attended the Martin Luther King breakfast run by the Catherine Street Community Center. I was very impressed with a young high school student who won this year's annual award. When he received the award, he said, at first, I was very excited about getting this honor. I knew how proud it would make my family and my church, and it was a great feeling of accomplishment. Then to understand the meaning of the award, I began reading the works of Dr. King. I was humbled, and I realized that this award called me to engage in the struggle that he gave his life for, and I can only hope I'm worthy to the task. That young man had asked the question, what have you to do with me, Jesus of Nazareth? And he realized that life is more than honors and fame, awards and rewards. 
The purpose is rather to engage in the urgent struggle to live out God's will. When we ask the question, what have you to do with me, Jesus? We are engaging in a life where we will seek God's will. We are opening ourselves up for what God's spirit has in store for us. And if you're wondering what exactly that might be, I think the story from Mark gives us a clue. And it's the second part of the story that connects with our lives. And that is about healing. I have a feeling that most of us have never thought of ourselves as healing other people. After all, we tend to have a stereotype of the flim-flam artist who seek to take our money in exchange for healing. You know, in Muscatine, especially remember, we remember the stories of a man named Norman Baker who wore purple suits and began a radio station, KT, KT, Know the Naked Truth, KTNT, I should say, Know the Naked Truth, and he sold elixir as a cure for cancer. If we are honest with ourselves, we have to admit that the story of Jesus healing people in the Gospels, they are a mixed bag for us. We love to read them and about the compassion and the power of our Savior. But these stories also leave us with some hard questions about why we don't seem to see those kind of healing miracles today. But I would contend that there is a difference between being cured and being healed. I've seen people who have been cured and I've seen people who have been healed. And there is a difference. I believe this story from Mark is calling us to bring healing to people who are broken, beat down, feel they are no good. And here's what I mean. <clears throat> PC Ennis recalls a story from his time at Trinity Presbyterian Church in Atlanta, and this is what he has to say. I was asked one time to perform an exorcism of sort. It was, I suppose, about midway in my ministry. I was serving an old historic church in downtown Atlanta. About 10 days before Christmas, the secretary buzzed the intercom to say, there's a young man here to see you. He says he wants you to bless him. No, he's not a member of the church, says he just wants you to bless him. Well, I knew what that meant, PC says. He wanted money, any excuse to get a foot in the door, but the emergency relief office was closed for the day, so I said, sure, show him in. He was not what I expected. He was neatly dressed, clean-shaven, late 20s, I imagined. There was an air of dignity about him, no glassy look in the eye, none of the usual signs of having been on the street, as we say. Sorry to take up your time, he said, but I just want your blessing. He went on to explain in a rather articulate, if un-Presbyterian way, that he had this devil on his back <coughs> that he could not shake. As much as he had tried, he could not get rid of it. And he thought that if he could just find a minister who would bless him, the devil would go away. He did not seem depressed or overly desperate. In fact, he appeared in pretty good spirits, very much in control, I thought. So I made some feeble attempt to explain that Presbyterians were not usually in the practice of casting out devils. All I want, he repeated, is your blessing. Well, it was Christmas, so I said, then tell me your name. Andy, he said. And with that, Andy knelt down on the carpet while I had a prayer which was not so much a blessing, at least not in the traditional sense, but rather a traditional Presbyterian prayer of thanksgiving for God's presence in Andy's life an acknowledgement of the way God had already blessed him, an affirmation of God's continuing concern and purpose for him, and the request that God would take away this devil that was preventing Andy from being the kind of person God intended him to be. With the amen, Andy stood up, smiled, shook my hand and said, thanks, and then he left. Not a word about money or a meal or a place to stay. 
All I want is your blessing, he said. All I want is your blessing. All I want is a prayer. And I shall be healed. You know that beloved hymn, I danced in the morning, and that hymn, one verse begins, I danced on the Friday when the sky turned black. It's hard to dance with the devil on your back. It is hard to dance or sing or find joy or really live when you feel like you have a devil on your back. And the devil or the unclean spirit can take many forms, anywhere from an addiction to wondering what your purpose in life really is. What have you to do with us, Jesus? What have you to do with me, Jesus? I think Jesus answers pretty clearly, bring healing to my people. And if the beginning of healing someone of the devil on their backs can be as simple as praying for them, if all they want, if all we want is a blessing, well then in Jesus' name, we can do that. We can do that. Amen.